Well, let's call the meeting order, if y'all don't mind. It's five o'clock. Uh, first thing on the agenda is a meeting, the minutes from our May, May 1st, 2017 meeting. Um, I don't think there's anything that, uh, well, it's been almost a year since we had a meeting, so. Oh, wow. uh, I think a lot of this stuff that we, that's on this, uh, that we talked about then, a lot of it's been done or in the process of being completed. You might be, uh, you might get enlighten us on that. I was looking through it and that's the budget, so. Certainly. Implementing the budget, so there's a lot of those things that we talked about. Yeah, but the minutes looked good to me. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else had Motion approved. Motion approved. Councilman Kelly, to approve the minutes for the May 1st meeting. Second. Second. Second with Councilman Jones. Anybody know any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. We'll move on. Okay, Jessica. You're in charge now. <laughs> All right. Well, I know you I might be sounding like a broken record a little bit now, but it seems like there's always a lot of planning that goes in before any major um, capital project, major treatment change takes place. And yesterday we had our bid for construction services to move forward with the chloramine uh, project. So it was the ammonia feed building and the uh, other applicable equipment and so forth associated with our uh, changeover for the addition of ammonia at the water plant to switch our primary disinfectant uh, post treatment disinfectant to chloramine. Uh, in your packet I've attached just a rough bid schedule uh, just with us reading the bids we will have on the council agenda for this coming Tuesday the actual uh, letter of recommendation and a full bid tab for you guys at that time but this is just a quick once over at the bids and what the numbers came in uh, and looks like we had a good bid. We had a lot of participation and Judy Construction is the apparent low bidder at this point in time and I feel like they're going to remain so at this point but they're a good contractor, reputable contractor. They were the uh, folks that built our Jerry Riley sewer plant for the city. Um, so been around a while. I think they'll do a good job for us. <coughs> just, uh, just, uh, just for, for my information, I'm sure, I don't know if everybody's for me. We went from a, to do this ammonia feed from what? The, the regular chlorine? Right, free chlorine, which will still, we still feed free chlorine to create the uh, chloramine, but there's just an addition of ammonia as well. So that, that creates a total chlorine instead of, will be with just for using free chlorine. So it's a chloramine with that ammonia addition. It What that should be doing, that, and this won't actually get transitioned over until probably late fall of 2018, but this is just to put in the improvements to gear us up to do that. It should allow us to keep a chlorine residual longer in the system. Um, so when we, the farther you Send your water. Right? Yes, it, it will. will. It will. <laughs> uh, there's a reason that uh, Louisville Water and Kentucky American and uh, use chloramine as their disinfectant. Because so, they're water so far. right, they're sending out. They're geographically. It's just going so far. That was another problem North Texas had with our water because they had Louisville and ours, and they couldn't mix it. Makes us right. more compatible. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. They were on the tail end of our our line too, basically. Uh, there's part there's parts of you know that they're sending out pretty far so we <coughs> since we have wholesale customers that we're sending to that are going another 20 miles or so after they purchase water from us I think this will be a benefit uh, not to mention uh, evidence has shown from other systems that it will should also help us reduce our disinfectant byproducts from you know a reaction that happens with disinfecting and reacting. Right, because it's going to hang out in the water, it's a little less reactive, so. It tastes better. Okay, <laughs> so you, uh, there might not be any change in, yeah. in, in taste, but um, what, what was that's our, a good thing. Uh, budget on the chloramine project? We had budgeted for construction around 900000 mm -hmm. for the actual construction portion. 
we will be finalizing our KIA loan documents and everything. It looks like we're all on target to be within our approved loan value. Um, so we'll kind of be finalizing all that stuff in, in the coming weeks. But I wanted you guys to get <coughs> just a little update since that just happened yesterday, that bid. Well, we can recommend it to the council then. So looked Let's pretty good. <laughs> Um, I guess another thing I might skip around a little bit on the agenda to the lead and copper sampling that's now going to be required. There's kind of a couple of reasons for that. We've been on reduced monitoring for lead and copper because we were feeding a, um, a phosphate into the distribution system that allowed a coating onto the pipes and so forth. And with this change, as we move to chloramine, we're no longer going to be feeding that chemical and providing that coating. Our pH is gonna be running a little bit higher. Um, so at the res as a result of us making those treatment changes, the Division of Water has asked us to go back on a lead, more uh, aggressive lead and copper um, sampling requirement. So we'll have to do, I think, a total of 60 lead and copper samples in uh, this year That's in 2018. That's because the pH change is why they Right, because it. of the phosphate, <clears throat> we are no longer using that phosphate mm -hmm. to put that coating on the system and uh, we're switching over to chloramine later in the year. So because of those two things and really they didn't really catch that we had made that change and that there might be something they'd want us to recheck. Anything that could have, they just want us to make sure that we're not losing any on our ductile iron pipes and metal pipes, that that's not um, leaching into the pipes and uh, creating a residual copper or lead, you know, going through. We have virtually no lead pipes in our system, so we've never really had any issue meeting lead, uh, lead and copper numbers. Um, but it's, it's just a precaution, just because we switched that, you know, no longer are feeding that, they're asking us to go back on that high level of sampling. I'm hoping that if the numbers come back good, that we'll be reduced back to where we only have to do it once every, once back down to, I think once every three years is what we've been on mm -hmm. for the last number of years. Larry might be able to answer that question a little bit better, but it's it's been for a while. It's never really been an issue for us. And More that just time. pertains to the your our delivery system, right? It's right. nothing to do with any customer after it takes over. No, at that no. Point, that it, same right. Point. It's just through our distribution uh, lines. Distribution lines. Mm -hmm. yeah. Since we're doing a new treatment method, if, if you keep the pH up, if you had acid, it'll leach the copper and lead. Right. If you have the pH higher than normal or higher than balanced, then you sh we should, if you repeat that a number of times and they'll get let us get back off but since we're changing our system they I guess they're having they're being careful that we uh, don't get out of balance and leach lead or copper right. so, <coughs> yep just trying to be compliant but again come budget time you might see there's an uh, increase in sampling that's going that's going to create a budgetary <coughs> impact um, because of that new requirement. We weren't required to do that. 60 additional samples, it's, that's a lot. So, just wanted to kind of give you that explanation. Um, let's see, rate study is underway in the water department. I have a meeting next week to kind of go over some capital improvements and things like that that can be built into that. But just wanted to give you guys some information that that is underway. Um, one of the items that I think we added to your list was this asset inventory. I, David Evans helped me with this with our GIS mapping. We constantly get better and better at our mapping and trying to dig and go through old plans and insert you know year pipe was installed, pipe type and some really nice things that we can do with that information is then graph it and see visually on the map where all of our old pipes are, what kind of can, uh, we can even overlay our leaks reports and see where do we have the most <coughs> breaks, where do we have the most customer complaints if there's, you know, some 
old cast lines. Sometimes we'll get discolored water if there's, you know, been fire department flushing or maybe a bigger break that's got things stirred up. So we document all of those things and this is kind of just a spreadsheet that has a lot of numbers, but if you kind of look at it, it's broken down across the top based on portions of our distribution system. And then down the left, we've kind of broken down into water age, and then material and pipe size. So we can kind of evaluate what we've got. But we, you'll kind of, what you'll notice is that in our central downtown area, that's the area of our system where we have the oldest pipe um, and the most cast in galvanized pipe, which is basically converts to, if you look at it on a map, that also correlates to the most leaks and you know those kinds of things as well. So what I will be doing in upcoming weeks is trying to come up with a game plan and a capital improvement plan that will target how much, how, how fast are we going to need to be making some of these improvements. We've been kind of replacing a little bit every year, but after looking at these overall numbers, I'm only putting a tiny dent in it. I'm really not going to be replacing enough of these lines at the current rate without having some maybe catastrophic failure where you can only put so many band-aids on <laughs> on old pipes. So that's going to be part of my capital improvement plan this year. It's going to be used to help with the rate study as well, making sure we are putting money back to fund that infrastructure replacement in, in a way that's uh, in the best interest of the community. So you know it's going to be coming. So. Right, and we're also looking at doing things. Um, Kind of a, in a block style like we're in a grid in the downtown area and looking to see how that correlates even with the sewer so if we're going to have the road tore up replacing water lines and converting everybody over we might it makes sense to try to get the sewer line as we go so kind of doing some planning there that ties to rate making um let's see also in that um, capital improvements looping of the system, we're looking at where our system's growing, where we've got the most demands, and where do we have what I would call maybe weak points, where we only have one feed. Uh, trying to, where does it make sense to provide loops in our distribution system so that we can provide an alternate feed, or even just better flow. Uh, one area that we know we need to provide a loop is in the along the 150 corridor right now the water flows from the nelson county industrial park tank and goes along woodlawn road all the way around the back side of woodlawn down poplar flat and then hits uh us 150 near 150 quick stop and then serves all of our customers uh, in Fredericktown and the east end that way so it's going a long distance um, with only one feed that whole way it would be really nice and help because there is so much growth in that woodlawn and poplar flat area, that Botland area with subdivisions and so forth, there's only an eight inch pipe. Did we it's, have that budgeted? We do have that budgeted. Yeah. I'm not sure I'm going to get all of that done just because there's a lot of planning and easements. And I thought we had that budgeted to go on out and tie that in. We do. On 150. On 150. So I, my goal is to get the spring that nailed down a little bit more and see make sure that but I may not get the all whole construction done this year but that was one another area is we could use another tie under the BG Parkway um, for water flow having another loop we've got that side of town. on that same side of town uh, we also only have one water feed into the Spring Hill subdivision in Marvin Downs in that area and that line is has got some age on it and there's again a high density of customers in that area so I would really like to get Spring Hill over on what we call the high pressure zone we kind of have a town zone and the East Bargetown zone but put them on the higher pressure zone and provide a loop again along 150 from about the Walmart area and come back and, and tie that back into into that neighborhood so that we again have an alternate feed there on the higher pressure zone and if there's a break we can we can still provide that 300 plus residents with water. 
<laughs> you have to pay attention to the proposed upgrade, I guess, to 150 in the right of ways that are they're looking at. I guess if you were to do that prior to that work. Right. I've talked to the highway department to see about maybe coordinating uh, both of these projects with their highway work, but realistically they're telling me it could be, you know, 10 years before that happens, and I don't think that we can wait 10 That's years. That's what I meant by the question, that yeah. you might need to look at that to see if there's a way that if you didn't have to do it prior to that, you've got to be cognizant of that right away issue. That's they told me to go ahead yeah. and that they would pay to move it wherever we are. So not to wait on their design and try to be far enough back because their design is not set. So they said to move forward with their water, with the location of the water line wherever we can get it. Yeah. And then they would pay to move it later because um, they may decide to widen it on the other side and it'd be fine. But um, well, I, I was them, trying to do them that. doing that bridge work, they're going to have to react to both the east side and the parkway as well as to the west side on 150. They're going to have to relax. I mean, they're going to build five lanes and they're going to be, <laughs> They're going to have to do something at some point. Take all that yes. traffic into two lanes on both sides. They're going to have to react, I think, before 10 years on that. Because we're working all the time <coughs> with funding issues. But that's the, that's the dilemma, is that by the time they get the right of ways and the scoping study and the design and then the funding, it could be as much as 10 years before that segment of 150 gets done. So we've been what talking about it since I started here. What phase are they in now? What, what phase are they in now? I mean, what's the, what they just started the work on that the bridge. bridge. Is that, that's the uh, on-ramp and off-ramp work. That's that they and, the yeah. and the expanding the width the of the bridge. They're going to have a turn lane in the center. and I think <coughs> That's where they're stopping. Four or five lanes there. Yeah. Right. But it's just the bridge. Yes. It's just that. Then all of a sudden you're feeding it back into two lanes on each side. It doesn't even extend to the Parkway Drive light. Um, it and doesn't that, extend that far? No. Yeah, and that, that side needs attention and of course back all the way to mm -hmm. McDonald's on this side of it. Yeah. Really needs the <coughs> most help is the three lane or the turning lane on the Bluegrass Parkway going yeah. westbound. Mm -hmm. That's where it needs the most help. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to weigh those options too. Does it make sense to wait or can we afford to wait? Um, but that's, those are some things I'm looking at. Um, I guess moving right along on to sewer items. Um, got some proposed amendments to the sewer use ordinance. Some of these amendments are directly as a result of our, well, what's the right word? We look at our local limits for what, how, what we can treat at the plants and set the limits for the industrial users based on our ability to treat, you know, those, those limits and what our available capacities are. And we look at those local limits pretty frequently um, but this past summer when they were looked at, there were some revisions that needed to be made. These revisions and proposed changes to the actual uh, maximum daily concentrations for certain um, parameters have already been approved through the Division of Water. They like to look at everything before I even propose it to you guys um, and the council for <laughs> approval. So. That's what a lot of these items are, just amending those limits um, based on what we can treat in our available capacities. The also yeah, 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 I'm here. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, like you got it's, it's mainly it's maximum daily concentration. Yes. So we went from uh, on the chromium. <coughs> you went from two seventy seven to one point seven. Does that have anything to do with the chloramine thing you just talked about? No. This has this, this is, is pretty is much sewer, wastewater discharge. Okay. So it's basically showing that there are certain items within like especially metals. The division of water is always looking at trying to reduce certain parameters as they get to the stream. Metals is a big one this year. Copper, um, that's a pretty tight one. Um, nickel, mercury silver, selenium, all those metals, zinc, uh, 
and they constantly are tightening down our permit discharge limits. So basically that local limit calculation is based on our potential to treat based on what we're allowed to discharge and then we have to limit it backwards. <coughs> what can we handle? So that's why some of these have been reduced. Um, there's one, the oh, cyanide was mm -hmm. increased and there was another, a couple other ones that increased, smiley, maybe just smiley, one. Smiley yeah, I'm really, that was shown that we could handle a little more of that and treat it without any. I guess they just took it off the permit altogether or took, took it out of the parameters. Um, Since you have less ductile iron in the system that can... Right, I mean, and again, we're back down to this, what's getting into the sewer. And I think some of that has to do with what the limits set by the permit itself. They might have taken iron completely off the permit, which <coughs> meant it was no longer a concern, you know, or a parameter of concern. I see wipes are, slush bowl wipes are out low on those. Yeah, the, the addition of making a clarification in our prohibited discharges was something that I added uh, wipes of any kind including those labeled flushable just we are having a lot of issue with flushable wipes in the system and the amount of maintenance costs that are associated with those um, I know that there's some systems all over the country that are actually in lawsuit right now against those manufacturers that are putting that labeling that wording on yeah f the word flushable on those products because I think even in New York City it's creating I mean unfathomable uh, monetary consequence they don't break down you can kind of do a little experiment and put it in a, a w bottle of water and shake it up and it it doesn't go anywhere it just we find that it, it's really even difficult to even take a jet rotter and, and you can't hardly flush them out, you know, to clean them out. So pump stations, I mean, I've had to pump little copper fields, pump station, five times in less than in two years just to remove the amount of debris. I've sent letters out to all residents in the neighborhoods where I find them and haven't really seen any change. So a lot of young kids in that neighborhood. Well, and I think it's a, it's adult force. stuff too that's happening. Adult wipes and whether it be cleaning wipes, I don't know whether they, you know, you wipe your seat and flush it and please don't do that. <laughs> I mean, because we get really enforced it because you don't can't trace them, I guess. You. Some you can. Some, Some you can. can follow it all the way back to the beginning <laughs> of the manhole and I've even tried that. Um, but at some point if we don't see some dilemma, that's going to create a definite direct rise in sewer rate because of the increased maintenance at the sewer plan I mean they come through the headworks and they get shredded a little bit but then what happens when they get in our lagoons is they get caught in the aerators and then that's aerator motor you know rewinding you know blown uh, wire it's just shorts out everything so my guys are actually getting out in a john boat turning aerators off and manually cleaning them out of each aerator and putting them in a barrel and a jump boat and hauling them out to the dumpster one by one once every once a week trying to and in this kind of temperature that's not good it, it's just not the safest thing to be doing and there's I'm looking to do like a good campaign and getting with Hannah to help put some education out there to the public so they understand mm -hmm. what what that causes to the system. So big big seems like such a minor thing that can cause such a problem. Um, another item that's been adjusted in our pro in our waste stream limit is our pH is going to get reduced narrow range to our discharge from a five and a half goes up to a six and from a ten down to a nine on the high end. I think that's a recommended parameter by EPA. Local uh, jurisdictions have the authority to widen that. Um, I'm actually kind of trying to follow that EPA guidance 
one other reason which we'll kind of get to in just a few minutes too is we were having chronic toxicity at both sewer plants been going on for a number of years and it's such a small amount it's not consistent so we might pass for three months straight and then we'll have a hit and we try to do uh, investigative work to identify the toxicant and it's no longer shows that it's present so it's so volatile it's not there but we're finding that <coughs> at a higher pH it's more toxic so when we reduce the pH back down it's no longer showing to be toxic so we're finding that even just a minor change in pH is affecting the sensitivity of our the Serodaphnia water flea so which is what we're judged on when we discharge so seems mm -hmm. like a minor thing people how's that really affecting you but it's it's minor toxicity that's getting just very slight I was looking at the high volume industrial user that were there uh, discharging more waste than potable water they're bringing in. Is that something the city's looking to require them to put a flow meter on there? No, 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 no. Um, that is kind of coming up with the request of more people wanting to reduce their sewer bills. Right now, our you know everyone gets built a sewer bill based on their water usage, and industry you know want to find ways to reduce costs be efficient with their utilities and so they want to be built only on what they're discharging and some of those requests are coming from users that really aren't having a high volume water user to begin with and the additional um, expense and administration costs and visits to calibrate and keep those sewer flow meters um, reading right in a wastewater system uh, it kind of offsets it creates more problems or more expense for the sewer department to try to do those things when really the sewer rate is based upon not all of your water use going down the drain anyway it's only based on about 80% so those that revenue is already based upon not everything going down so we want to allow the option of a sewer flow meter for high volume users if you're using you know a million gallons of water a month and you think your sewer discharge is going to be reduced by being discharged like half of that you know that's we want to be fair and, and allow that to happen um, but again if you're only using 50,000 gallons a month and you only discharge in 30 that that's really not not practical. practical to implement that. Okay. Um, I, I just I was looking at A here. It says if you discharge more water to the sewer system than you purchase, it just that's, seems like you're hauling in water and putting it down, and you ought to charge more. Well, to the sewer. that that's to create the caveat for uh, Barton's. For instance, they're a distillery that. Uh, discharges sewer but they're not using all of our city potable water to produce so I can't just use their water usage anyway that's not a, an applicable um, from a lake. yeah because they're getting it from the lake to require them to have a sewer they do they do so that's what I'm saying they have the ability to have one because they have more water discharging than what they might be purchasing but, but then the city want to make them do that Yes, they already they already do. Okay, sorry. It's, well, they already do, but because the thing says we, the industrial user may request the meter. It doesn't say the city has a right to demand it. Well, uh, that, that kind of falls under the pretreatment requirements. Okay, it's just somewhere. So else. it's kind okay. of in there already. Right. But okay. I didn't want to say because hey, someone has a ton of inflow and infiltration, and they're directing stormwater that's not supposed to be in there. That they can ask me to, you know, <coughs> meter that. I, you know, I don't want to promote stormwater from getting in there right so. it, it just seems that maybe these things will um, increase their sewer bill rather than decrease it and, and why you know if we're giving them that they may put the flow meter on there what's why would they request it if their sewer bill will go up because of this flow meter right well and i guess i could have amend some of that wording to clarify that a bit yeah for sure. generally they're looking the to offset it. Like <clears throat> gallon user that might get paid 60 percent right. water you know info right. It would be because of they the might, They might only use, right. <clears throat> I mean, a gallon user might only use uh, discharge 100,000 gallons. Mm -hmm. where they're gonna and I guess I could add, 
or at the request of the city um, the city could request or could require um, but I didn't also want the same example that they not ask to have a lot a used a, yeah, yeah, because B, they're not yeah, yeah B would be in favor of the industry like C would be in favor of the city of heaven because if you're allowing stormwater in it mm -hmm. you're therefore you uh, need to be charging more on your sewer than what the water meter would allow. Right, and so, this is so. given an opportunity for where a sewer flow meter would be uh, a, would be allowed and or possibly required. Okay, yeah, I, so I, mean, I guess yeah, I'm giving criteria on, on yeah, options, just change that word, yeah. yeah, just change that wording, I think. Right. Yeah, I say in that highlighted at the last end that it must be approved in accordance with the sewer use permit requirements and meet some of these those conditions. So yeah. they would meet that condition to have a flow meter, and in fact, we probably would likely require them to have one in that instance. Yeah. But yeah, that person that they may request or, we, or city may require, I guess. Right. Generally, they nobody's asking unless they want to reduce their bill. Right. Right, but, but in the case of, like I said, in the case of C, the city may want to demand that. Mm -hmm. so. And that would be, that falls under the industrial permit, but I could add language to clarify that. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yep. Of course, I hadn't read the whole ordinance. Like you said, it might be covered somewhere else and just be redundant. I think it just change the top line saying that the city may require industrial users may request or the city may require yeah. case by case basis based on their based on these criteria. On their permitted so, so, uh, yeah, the industry is not going to request it but I'm saying. Right. Right. <laughs> and that one's rare. I mean, I, I don't know that there's going to be many more using that option. <laughs> yeah. Usually it's A or B. Yeah. In the case of the distilleries, it's mostly going to be B, usually, right? Yes. Because most of their water gets trucked off that they use. That they use. Barrel duck, yeah. Well, it gets trucked off in slop. Yeah, so that's slop, that's and then, of course, they add, they proof it in a barrel, as I understand, so I use it, mm -hmm. put a lot of water in a barrel. I'll proof it to a certain level. So are you gonna find this? Are you gonna find <laughs> tune this a little bit just before? Yes, I'll probably just add. I'll probably just add that. Or city may require up in the first sentence under B, and I think that will cover us. Everybody okay with that? The Jesus that she's gonna do. We were over here talking about that. No, no, I asked. I asked. She does. She gotta make these uh, small changes. Before she brought before the council for recommendation to the council, to uh, I'm sure she will. Yep, I've got it noted That's there. So okay, you guys. The <laughs> other change that I've done is kind of simplified the surcharging for the industrial users to some degree. I've had some folks uh, come to me asking. Um, we state what residential strength waste is. But yet we're surcharging for industrial or residential strength waste. So when we were looking at the overall surcharging again, kind of based on that same what we have the ability to treat, you know, in those parameters, uh, we're, we came up with what our actual what does it cost to treat per pound, and what are those you know in those criteria. So what I've done is to try to provide some incentive for industry to have in residential strength waste stream being discharged, uh, I've basically not surcharged that dollar, that value. Because there's just like anybody else, they get a sewer rate, normal rate based on flow, flow volume, and then if they exceed that residential waste stream, that's when the surcharging kicks in. So just kind of clean that up a little bit and created um, a surcharge for that anything for instance BOD 250 milligrams per liter the permit limits that we write 
say we can handle up to 1400 milligrams per liter and I've got a single charge surcharge rate for that um, and then anything over the permit limit I've got a higher surcharge rate so if they're if they're getting for instance over 1400 milligrams per limit they have now exceeded their permit that's a violation and that surcharge is then doubled because of that concentration value and I've kind of just followed suit with that this will likely be I don't think this is going to generate us a bunch of money because we've increased that rate in fact it might even be a slight decrease initially just because we're not charging for that first 250 and if everybody's doing a good job in their pretreatment they really may see a deduct in their bill because um, if you, you notice some of these uh, mid-range are either barely increased or in some cases went down depending on what what the parameter was there was also a typo in the ordinance for ammonia it had it listed similarly to our BOD and TSS and had an extra zero on there <laughs> so ammonia was supposed to have been 140 milligrams per liter instead of 1400 so so how many <clears throat> how long do you have to be over 1400 uh, milligrams per liter before your charge double is it one hit I mean, it's an sample. average okay. so if we're for instance if we're sampling once a month and you're over then you get surcharge for that month for the whole volume that based on the flow the volume that month um, if you only get sampled once a quarter and you have a hit you know we will let them know if there's still some time if they want to pay for additional sampling if they think the issue that they occurred is back in compliance we can we can go from there but if there's no other data we is, is sampling on the city or is it on the on the commercial user in other words it would behoove them to to have quarterly sampling then it's it's different based on the industry yeah. some industry have self-monitoring in addition to the city monitoring so for instance there's some industry that we sample um, once a month and they're self-monitoring and they have a, a, their own third-party lab doing sampling twice two other times that month they provide us that lab third-party lab data we average it again and then we they don't that surcharging gets averaged if the overall average for the month is not over that then they're okay they would get the lower surcharge rate so that's it's all about sampling uh, if somebody's getting sampled each week same thing we would average the other good samples in and see how that works out same thing with a violation if they're back in we would only charge on that week until it went back in compliance so and all those things are spelled out in each industry's permit um, when we sample we kind of work those things out to some degree in fact some uh, there was one industry that had gone through some issue and they elected to increase they were okay with paying for some more sampling just to help help offset some of that if they were having some changeover and processes that they were doing to kind of average some of those numbers but if we don't have any numbers to compare it to they don't talk to us and inform us that they've got something going on you know we try to work with them if, if they're in communication so that's basically what that ordinance is is kind of clarifying those rates and the concentrations based on looking at those load allocations any more questions about that okay um, we did get our this was in the budget you guys are likely already up to speed on this but HDR did complete the preliminary engineering report for the Rowan Creek trunk sewer and the Potter Stock pump station and looked at some improvements at the water plant uh, that or at the sewer plant I'm sorry the Town Creek to uh, with respect to that additional trunk size flow and looked at our modeling they did the model um, they're actually on the agenda for next on Tuesday's meeting you'll see a service agreement contract for services to move forward with that design work actually 
doing the final design, doing construction documents, survey work to move forward with those projects. Do they have a tendency to be when they want to start, now that they've got the design work all done with all this stuff that they're working on? They but no, because the design work's not done. That was just the study that kind of re preliminarily laid out the how big stuff needed to be. The actual con uh, construction plans haven't are what they're moving about to move forward with. So we still have to go through and get the actual uh, the layout. You know where the trunks need to go, best location, get easements and profiles and plan sheets and kind of develop those documents. Pump station details and get that all fine-tuned. So the first part is just recommendation how big a facility is. Right. Be what do we need to do? Do we What needs to happen at the pump station? Can the pump station handle it? If not, what capacity it needs to be taken to? What's the power? So generally this is what needs to happen and then we've got to work on fine-tuning that design and yeah getting the details and creating those do design documents for construction so they're ready to get started so that'll be coming to you guys um, let's see one other thing I wanted to kind of discuss briefly that will be in the an upcoming budget and I'm hoping I can maybe get some of this done started this year depending on what my <coughs> existing budget looks like but um, H2S gas is something else that we're finding is just wreaking havoc on our existing sewer infrastructure. It's sulfur? Hydrogen sulfide. Yeah, Hydrogen sulfide gas. So Hmm? Is chemistry one of your good subjects you consider English? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I know. It wasn't my best subject, chemistry, was it? <laughs> What's it a byproduct of? The gas. The gas. It's just when waste streams mm -hmm. go septic, it creates, it off puts After that. Septic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The lack of oxygen creates that that gas once it's used up all the oxygen it creates that kind is of Is that what we were getting from the Barton is that the gas that was that was, that was creating a, yes uh -huh. yeah. it was creating a, a, a really bad odor and it's smell. Like aeration then mm -hmm. that's why I was looking at Same there. thing happens when you are pumping waste a long distance um, it's going to such a distance that by the time it actually hits air again for the first time it has all this gas built up that it's created and that gas not only does it smell bad but it is highly corrosive to concrete or anything metal you know so if we had had any control panel sometimes it um, you'll see that happening where you'll get stain, you know steel panels that'll get all corroded but mainly what we see is the deterioration of the concrete manholes it'll eat the steps up you know any metal steps mm -hmm. it, it's kind of kind of crazy we a couple of years ago we kind of noticed that issue with our discharge points of a lot of our pump stations we went in and we uh, provided a coating at like the first three or four manholes downstream where it discharged to help protect the system and that seems to be doing pretty good we've gone back and checked on on those and it looks pretty good what we also found because we tightened up that system and sealed it up so well is that the gas just kept moving downstream so now instead of having four manholes that are deteriorated now they're looking good I've got the next 15 <laughs> that are completely eaten up in just a two-year period of time so it's you know we're over time as it keeps moving down so that's something that I would say was an unforeseen um, consequence of of having pump stations you know we're really hilly you can't gravity everything but that's that's a definitely a, a draw a drawback so even the Town Creek <coughs> trunk line where the Bloomfield Force Main discharges in that project occurred like in 2011 2012 we changed out a manhole where it enters and then we coated like the next two or three downstream. We've gone back and looked at the manhole that was new. We There was an admixture put in that concrete that was supposed to help 
protect it against some of those gases, make it stronger waterproofing agent. Um, finding that that didn't, that admixture didn't really work as good as maybe it claimed. Um, that needs to be coated. And the manholes that have been coated still look pretty good, but again, beyond that point, on the other side of 245, heading down toward Community Park, a lot of those manholes that were put in in 08, 09, or 09, 09, 2010, are seeing significant signs of deterioration. So, is the um, only answer to protect the, what's there, or is it increased flow that can help prevent it from getting septic so fast and get it on through the system? Is that the long term? It's a double edged it sword because the more flow you have, the more you try to dilute the flow, then I'm inundating and taking up capacity of my trunk mains, you know, for waste streams. Um, and take getting all that rainwater at the plant, you know, you don't want to so send potable drinking water. Yeah, I think protection. I'm also looking, especially in this location, about adding some vents so that I can actually vent it out. Next question, if you could vent yes. the area. In an area the where there's not really any residents around to smell it, it shouldn't really be a big deal. There's not anything really there to. So you're kind of pre-aerating it. Yeah. Well, you're just allowing that gas out, out, you know, let it hit the atmosphere so it's no longer confined. So I think that could. So we'll get higher concentrations that build in. Right, right. By staying in, it's just continuing to act, activate. Um, Obviously, you have to be careful whenever you're in a confined space and you've got all those gases. You know, I don't want, you can't send a man down a manhole when there's that level of H2S gas. We have uh, gas meters before we ever send anyone down. I definitely don't want to create any employee in, in an unsafe situation. So the other, the other thing that I'm looking at doing is communicating with Bloomfield. They have a bioxide station that they use during the summer months to help control, help, supposed to help with that. Um, I'm thinking that they probably ought to need to turn it up. Maybe that distance is too long. Maybe there needs to be a subsequent point where they add, you know, a chemical in closer to town, you know, after it's, you know, to try to re-neutralize that waste stream, you know, instead of, otherwise it'll just go septic again. Uh, I think the magic number in any technology that I've looked at for this issue has been 48 hours. If a waste stream doesn't, um, is in a syst closed system for more than 48 hours, it's gonna go septic again if it doesn't have oxygen and, um, and, and such. So there's some other systems out there. We had a similar problem at the Jerry Riley plant. So we've coated those headworks up. Um, so yeah, it's something when I, once you're in working the system in a, wastewater stream you, you don't really never really dawned on you just like tighten up the system keep the rainwater out so that we can have our capacity and don't have overflows but the tighter you then if you have it if it is vented or you have pick holes you get water in it and I can't have too much inflow going in um, or if it's in a neighborhood then the gas comes out and it smells to high heaven and that's a not a pleasant thing for residents to have so that it, it's a double-edged multi-faceted issue on trying to figure out the best way to neutralize like the it. Bi the yeah there's a chem it's a there's a chemical that you can use to help reduce that odor um and reduce the which creates the it's supposed to help neutralize the, and prevent that formation of the gas sometimes i think it helps but again if you're going if it's that waste stream is going more than in there a little more than 48 hours no matter what you put in it's going to go septic again well, by the time it discharges. You might like say so might make more frequent then. But you have to you can't just pump it into the line easily. Generally those backside stations are put in to the wet well at the pump station. So that's a feed point it can it drips in to the waste stream and it pumps on out. You can't pump chemical easily in into the high pressure line it creates some unique things there's systems out there there are some ozone systems that they actually microfuse ozone and oxygen into that stream but your pipe has to always be full you know to make sure it's hitting into the liquid um, at all times and they're 
pretty expensive. Plus, you have to make sure you've got power source and. Oh, it needs electricity. You got to create ozone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, needs some electricity. Mm -hmm. So there's some points that I'm looking at potentially, maybe in some points in the system, like around the Corman's Crossing line, potentially, that could help. Um, Probably would be a good investment. I think it could be. Prevent you, you deterioration of your system in the area. No, the coating doesn't seem to Not be often, no. I mean, the only time we get odor complaints in that area is if we have an air relief that is malfunctioning, like an air relief valve that is um, allowing that air to get out, escape the line so that you don't get, you know, cause the pumps to cavitate because you got too much air built up. But um, it releases that air, and if it gets stuck open, oftentimes people really get complaining about the odor. But for the most part, that doesn't seem to be a big issue on that line. Now, again, at the station where all that waste comes down at the Withrow Creek pump station, it's pretty bad. And I think we're fortunate at this point in time that there's not a lot of residents in that area to smell it because it's it's pretty pretty strong. So. Um. Let's see, I think we're getting pretty close to the end here. Getting back to the toxicity that we're ex we've been experiencing at the wastewater plants that's kind of been chasing a ghost. Uh, I will be going to Frankfurt tomorrow to sit down with the Division of Water and talk about ways that we can better use the money we're spending on all of the accelerated sampling uh, wet testing that we're doing. Um, it's costing anywhere from thirty to eighty thousand dollars. I say thirty thousand because that's <coughs> Town Creek's only been doing the accelerated biomonitoring for about a year and two months. But that was an additional probably thirty eight thousand dollars we spent in lab sampling trying to identify a ghost toxicant. Uh, same at Jerry Riley we've been on this ghost hunt for going on three years now and the TR, TRE program with the Division of Water says you have to go six months without um, a, a hit a toxic hit in your wet testing before you can come out of that well we've been on this so long we're not finding it you know whatever we could do we've tried to do um, real specific ticks on this toxicant and we've not been able to identify it. There's been a few times we've been able to get at certain times there was enough left that gave us a rough family. Um, and we're thinking that it could be a what's the right word? I want to make sure I, this is not my everyday nomenclature. So I want to make sure um, I'm using the right wording. Nomenclature, it's a, it's a, it's a big kind of college word. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically, it's volatile. I've got this TRE report. Um, a nonpolar organic or a surfactant. That's what we think it could be. A nonpolar organic or a surfactant, which is a huge range of things. I mean, it could be um, something in the herbicide or pesticide family which is not one reason why maybe we don't see it in January, February, or March, but sometimes we see it in May or June. You know, same thing in the fall when you get more in rains. And so I'm, we're thinking it could be nothing, something that's not even related to a single point source. It could be a non-point source coming in through, again, leaky taps, leaky, um, sewer services, manholes, just that inflow. It could be coming in from runoff from, you know, the use of pesticides or herbicides or um, heck, it could even be a mild degreaser, an organic degreaser or something. Um, but again, we've not been successful and there's just, we would like to try and propose to get out of the accelerated biomonitoring such that we can use those monies and maybe use it in a public outreach program for proper use of herbicides and pesticides in the community, you know, kind of educate the public more. 
that maybe could potentially reduce that uh, or use it in that money and try adding a nutrient or some type of chemical feeds at the plant to see if we can somehow take out that surfactant. You know, we can maybe settle it out or treat it in some way. It's kind of a, a wait and see, you know, maybe it'll work, but because it's not there consistently every month, you know, we can maybe try it for eight months, nine months and, and see what happens. If we don't see any toxicity, then maybe, maybe that was it. But that's, I think is better served in trying to resolve the problem rather than spending a bunch of money when the EPA guidance on how you go about finding these toxicities, the TRE and TIE pro program, is designed more to find uh, acute toxicity. So, you know, a, a, you get a toxicity level of, say, a value of a 39. We're getting 1.36, you know, when a less than one is considered no toxicity. So, we are not killing the bugs they're just not making enough babies mm. you know they've had to maybe reproduce and have mm. 19 colonies maybe they had 10 you know or 15 sometimes so we're just barely missing it so that's what we're proposing tomorrow uh, hoping we can get some movement because is your testing for this toxicity is it is it a is it a lab test that you have to perform to to determine that it's there or, is, or can you do it with live testing can you do it in wells or <coughs> in the line to try to isolate where it could be coming from in other words is there a test or a piece of equipment that you can move around Mm -mm. It's, it has to be lab it's a so it microbiological to, lab right. test that has right. to yeah it, it, there's okay. kind of a scan of things but and it's on mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. effluent of each plant so it's what's discharge coming out the discharge of our plant then again once every three or four months we might fail the seridaphnia by this much. Do we know what area of town it's coming from? No, we can't find it because whenever we try to set up uh, our TIE and run another sample to see if we can identify it, it shows no toxicity we pass. So that's the dilemma. Whenever we try to retest and try to isolate it and figure out what family it's in, it's no longer present. Always in the same months of the year? No, not always. We even tried to find out if it's something maybe coming through uh, one plant and then it's being pumped to the other plant and that's why we're getting it but that's not exactly the case either sometimes both places you know were you know maybe charlotte failed and mark wasn't sending anything to her to begin with it's it's all over the board it's unpredict it's kind of been somewhat unpredictable so that's kind of been kind of been the ghost you know it, it's hard to find what's wrong when it's the next time you run the same test on the same sample it's good or in the way the test works too you take Monday sample and you set the test up and then you have a sample for Monday Wednesday Friday so you start running the, the test and then on Wednesday you add it takes five days to run it so you add Wednesday sample and you set the test up again well everything looks good Wednesday and maybe you start seeing Thursday after you've added Wednesday sample it starts to go south a little bit and by the time you add Friday so we're even trying to figure out all right is there certain days of the week but even that's hard because we're not sampling the influent we're sampling the effluent mm -hmm. and our treatment process takes Got the lag seven days <clears throat> to maybe it's ten days depending on the flow rate through the facility it's mm -hmm. so we're not your typical plant so it makes some of that identification a little difficult so mm. that's my game plan to try to find uh, ways that we can try to address the issue but spend the money more wisely rather than just coming up snake eyes or don't whatever you want <laughs> losing losing the chips man we just feel like we're losing the chips so complain. um the, the other item, I think we're, we're almost done. I've kind of already touched on replacing aging infrastructure and sewer, the same applies. Um, we did get our final easement for a project that you guys are probably tired of seeing showing up on the budget, which is the Mockingbird um, Second Street uh, Sewer Replacement Project. 
So I just spoke with Robin this afternoon and she's going to put that back in her uh, queue now that we've got our final easement and finalize those plans and hopefully try to get us ready for bed um, sometime in February for that sewer project. One thing I'm kind of hitting the new roadblock in is the railroad now requires because when we have a sewer line under the railroad we have to pay almost like a lease agreement. We're looking at doing, we're going to move forward with a one-time payment that is going to be cheaper long term for us to just pay all at, at once. But they also now are requiring that the city's insurance lists and has an additional liability when you have infrastructure under their right of way and they have to be listed as the national insurance. Yes, and our insurance uh, we're trying to get some quotes right now, but they're saying they can't even give me a quote until we know who the contractor is, what the estimate estimate of the bore is, and I'm a little confused, so I need to make some clarifications because what they're asking for up front with the agreement, they're asking for that too. That'll be a second insurance policy they want to see, but they want to just have in our general liability have them named in those locations. So I've got to kind of work through some of that. I've not had, we've really not had to do that before this latest two two possibly we can just condemn it. I mean, condemn the easement so we don't have to do all that. Yeah, uh, you can't because they are there first. Well, you can condemn it just like, you know, anybody owns a property, you can condemn the easement across town. And they own it. We know. can try that with the railroad. It's, nobody else has really had any luck with that. Um, it's kind of, it's kind of odd because I tried to, say that A, we're in an existing, we already have a sewer main there. I'm just trying to improve and replace that I mean, that we'll, we have to pay for the easement. I mean, right. one-time payment, but they can't put any stipulations on insurance and all that stuff, because, you know, whatever that we devalue their property by by crossing it. But Something about it's, you know, it's not It's not cheap to do it, kind of. I'm just saying if it can't become so onerous and Right. Insurance, it's so expensive and everything that they just... I don't know exactly how complicated it's going to be. Like I said, this is kind of the first one we've had to do the insurance portion for. This is the second time they've asked for it, but I haven't actually moved forward with either project yet. We're just now, this is going to be the first one. Nazareth uh, Water Main is going to be another one where we're in the same, a similar situation. So. so but these are improved crosses, not... And not New crossings? Is that is that what you're saying? One will be new. The yeah. existing, the one here on Mockingbird, is an existing that we're improving. And I have we had to get into a new agreement before we weren't paying a lease uh, because the crossing occurred when it was under a different ownership. The I think it was CSX Railroad at the time. But once they looked up the agreement, and I'm now having to go in a new place. <laughs> they got me. <laughs> oh, you might have to get some of that. that. Absolutely, absolutely. I know it's something that's come up with many utilities and railroads. Um, it's I kind of a common thing. Railroad it's kind of a common thing. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't pass that up. <laughs> <laughs> if there um, were any accidents on, on something like that, everybody's going to be. Everybody's Right. And they've been pretty good. They've been very responsive. You know, whenever I had questions, they got back with me pretty, uh, very quickly. Um, but again, I'm now, I've kind of been, been sitting, waiting for a while. You're talking about the insurance side. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, or even just the agreements with right. the railroad. Their communication's been pretty timely. So if we needed to make some clarifications. I think they would be willing to talk with us and so forth but that's basically all I have I know that was a lot thrown at you in an hour we have rate study down here too yeah. that's you basically just, the same we pretty much already talked to it I didn't talk to, to that point up in the water section <clears throat> I didn't I forgot to take it off I was using an old agenda to kind of go by but We'll be looking, I guess, to that point, we'll be looking at rates for sewer also as we start incorporating and looking at the big capital projects that we have coming up and the infrastructure kind of O&M stuff that we need to be doing on the sewer. It'll be factoring in. Yeah, 
studies your head law in house or would you sub any of that out? No, I'll probably get some outside consulting help to um, I'll be helping and assisting and providing them a lot of information. Um, but I think it's good to get a third party kind of looking at it and going over the numbers. Um, making sure we're not missing anything. Right. The two things you're going to bring before the council are the, the BTAB and the uh, amendments to the sewer. On the yes. yes, and then there's the, also the agreement for HDR. Yeah, HDR. Yeah, HDR, <coughs> farming, uh, bid tab, and, and the yep, and the sewer change. That's that's coming to you, Steve. Yes. Yeah, okay. And so do they have a proposal now then on there? They do. Um, the overall, let me make sure I can get to the bottom of this, is $652,820 for the bargain budget. price. Is that in our budget? Mm -hmm. I mean, within the budget? Yes. I'd budgeted not knowing how fast this needed to go with the industry coming in, I budgeted two million to kind of put towards this part, the this Rowan Creek project. So we're good. The, and that's construction and everything, no one that wasn't just the That was to get construction started. Yeah. That's not gonna be the whole thing. That was me very preliminarily before we had any need study. Mm -hmm, the actual studies in sizing and um, how far we needed to go. What, uh, I guess, there's an option in this study that I asked them to look at for Woodlawn area. I know there's been some discussion about the Woodlawn Springs Golf Course, um, maybe converting to single family homes. There's still some pockets of that part of our system that have room for growth in that area. There's not currently a gravity sewer that catches all of that there's a pump station at Woodlawn Springs that again wasn't designed to handle everything. So I look, looked at HDR look at extending the trunk line on up the Rowan Creek that would then open up some of that property for gravity to be gravity fed rather than having small um, development whether it be multifamily or uh, condos and so forth with their individual pump stations again talking about the consequences of pump stations we've been here talking about today um, that would come up and then collect catch the waste stream and take Woodlawn Springs pump station offline altogether and allow everything to gravity into the trunk line. So stop near Spencer Manningly is that where it is now? It <coughs> stops um, at the back end of like Tullamore is where it stops and then it kind of comes north and goes under the parkway towards the industrial park is kind of where the gravity stops right now. So right now, everything on the north side and even adjacent to 605 to Woodlawn Road, like Rowan Creek condominiums and uh, Ashley, well not Ashley, early times, you know, that's kind of going into a little pump station that then pumps everything over the discharges into the gravity line near presidential estates and then hits the trunk line that's over on the other side of Spencer Mattingly, you know, and comes on down in 245. So it makes sense that we could, um, there could be some partnering and shared costs from the development community and the landowners where that they would need to make improvements anyway, they could put towards the gravity line that would, again, reduce this H2S issue we have uh, long term pump maintenance, inner, you know, power costs, odor control, chemical feed costs, because again, we're in residential neighborhoods, and by eliminating that pump station too, again, it would benefit the city as well to not have that long-term maintenance for the existing pump station. Rather than having those, those folks just pay to upgrade it, again, I'm pushing that. We, we already have odor control complaints, odor complaints from folks who live where these force mains discharge in the presidential estates and the end of Woodlawn Springs, I guess it's near Council Drive. You know, again, we're constantly battling, battling those issues. So 
to me, it makes sense for there to be some partnering uh, to have that phase of, of a trunk going up. Uh, opens up kind of infill development, which I think makes sense for the community uh, without having, again, pump stations and. Well, we may not know about Woodlawn Springs for years since they've got council hiring fighting. So. Right, but there's still a lot of other property between there and where I'm discussing this. People have been calling me about, hey, what about this potential, you know, development potential. Mm -hmm. With the community growing, a lot of our subdivisions, the phases keep going. You know, there's about all the available lots have been sold and are building out now. And um, I think folks are looking for expanded, you know, some new subdivision locations. And where does it make sense to put those? So that's all I've got. It's enough, right? <laughs> Anybody else got any questions or anything? We adjourn this meeting. Thank you, Jessica. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being with the board. Thank you, Dad.